Hey, for those of you at our Sparta campus, we welcome you today. God bless you for being a part. Our Livingston campus, Pastor Jeremy and all that gang up there, we welcome you today. Our Baxter campus, I'm moving to Baxter. I'm leaving Bangham after three years. I've waited for three years for a Taco Bell in Bangham, and they haven't put one in. So I'm coming to Baxter. And I'm glad to be down there with our campus pastor in Baxter, Sister Montana. She's a phenomenal campus pastor. Pastor Houston helps her out. So Sister Montana, we're glad to come down there and help you. And for all of you here today, you got up. You got up. You're, how many are sleepy still this morning? Everybody still sleepy this morning? Well, thank you for coming. Isn't it a beautiful day in Tennessee? It's a beautiful day in Tennessee. And for those of you who are joining us online all over the world, we welcome you. And especially to those of you, our friends in the correctional institutions, we're so glad you've joined us. Let's give them a hand. Would you do that? <laughs> Hey, I'm, I'm Eddie Turner, and I teach here a little bit when pastor asks me to, and our wonderful pastor is out of town. If you came to hear him, please come back. He is worth coming back over and over and over again to hear. He is absolutely fantastic. So he'll be back in here before long. He's just taking him a little break. So come back uh, to hear our pastor. We're glad you're here. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. Notice what the, uh, the writer says. He says, the way, or we would say the path, the direction. You could say the race or the course of the righteous. Who are the righteous? Those who know Christ as Lord and Savior. Those of us who have put our faith in Christ Jesus. Born again believers, the way, the direction, the course, the race, the path of born again believers is like the first gleam of dawn, which shines ever brighter until the full light of day. But, verse, 18, verse 19, but the way of the wicked, the path, the direction of the wicked is like total darkness. They have no idea what they're stumbling over. Does uh, anybody remember the blockbuster movie uh, National Treasure or National Treasure 2, The Book of Secrets? Anybody remember that, that movie? The lead actor is Nicolas Cage. Maybe, maybe that'll joggle your memory. Nicolas Cage, who plays the character Benjamin Franklin Gates. And uh, he's a historian, and he's an amateur cryptologist. And Gates and his team are on a quest to find the lost treasure once protected by the Knights Templar and then hidden by the Freemasons in the early days of the United States of America. In both of these movies, in both of those movies, Gates is searching for and following clues to find the treasure's location. As soon as they discover one clue, that clue leads them to another clue which leads them to another clue. The entire movie is filled with suspenseful searching, exciting discoveries, but then ensuing frustration because all they ever find is more clues. They never find the treasure. They're always looking for the treasure. Now, before uh, Nicolas Cage came out with National Treasure, there was a series of blockbuster movies that made everybody want to be an archaeologist. And that was, came out in 1981. How many remember 1981? Anybody remember 1981? Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Anybody seen that movie, Indiana Jones? Harrison Ford plays Indiana Jones, who navigates clue followed by calamity, followed by clue, followed by calamity, in search of the greatest biblical artifact known to man, the Ark of the Covenant. And Raiders of the Lost Ark ends with Jones finding the Ark, or possibly finding the Ark, because the last scene of the movie shows the United States government taking that box that the, he supposedly put the Ark in to some warehouse in some unknown location 
But then you see the warehouse, and inside the warehouse, there's hundreds and hundreds of other boxes that look just like it. That leads the viewer to think, well, is this the true ark? Have they found a bunch of other arks? And the United States is just trying to find every ark that's out there. So regardless of how suspenseful it is, and I love those movies. I love National Treasure and I love Indiana Jones. But regardless of how suspenseful and exciting and how many bugs and worms and snakes that Indiana Jones has to crawl through, I finish those movies very frustrated, very frustrated because you don't know if they find it or not. You don't know if they finally arrive at their destination, if they find their treasure, if they find the, the artifact, if they find the right place. You don't know it or not. That's why I like Clint Eastwood movies. Listen, when he shoots you, there's no doubt about it, you are dead. <laughs> but these, these movies, the, the, you don't know. Indiana Jones, uh, Benjamin Gate, you don't know if you found it or not. You know, the number one question that I've received in my, all my years of ministry is, is, is undoubtedly this. Pastor Eddie, what's God's will for my life? Can I find out what God wants me to do on earth? Why was I born? What is my purpose for being here? Is there a purpose for my life? Or am I just a piece of the puzzle in the random selection process. Why am I here? And can I know for sure why I'm here? What am I supposed to do with my life? And especially for those of us who are older, now that we've gotten older and close to retirement or finished your career, does God still have a plan for me? Is God's plan for my life over? Or maybe you've come late to the kingdom of God. Maybe we've spent our life living for the devil, living for our selfish pursuits. God and eternal things have never really been a priority in our life. But now, at this point in our life, and might be older for you, uh, suddenly spiritual things have become important, and your need for Christ has started to really be a priority in your life. And you think, you know, I've wasted so much of my life. I've just thrown away so many years. Does God still have a plan for my life? Does he have, have I missed God's plan for my life? These are questions that I'm continually asked over and over again. And let me tell you real quickly to start this is yes, 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 God has a plan for your life. He has a plan for every one of our lives. Regardless of our age or regardless of our history, God has a plan for your life. And then once people realize that God has a plan for your life right now, regardless if you're five years from uh, the end of your life, regardless if you're in middle age or regardless if you're just a child getting ready to enter school, God has a plan for your life. But a lot of people, when they realize that God has a plan for their life, unfortunately, they don't know how to find God's plan. They don't know what it is, and they don't know how to find it. Many people, many Christians, think God is playing hide and seek with them. They equate finding God's will for their life like a scavenger hunt. Go here to find this clue. And then this clue will take you to another clue, which leads you to the next place. And, and if you get it the right place at the right time, maybe you'll get the prize at the end. But you don't know what the prize is until you make it to the end. So many of us spend our entire life questioning, does God have a plan? And if he does, what is it? And if, it, if I can find, how do I find God's plan for my life? And, and if, if I find it, how can I make sure I'm on the right track? Listen to what the word of the Lord says. Look with me at Romans chapter 14, verse 12. Notice what Paul says. Paul's talking to Christians, and listen to what he says. He's talking to Christians. He's not talking to sinners. He's talking to people who are going to heaven. And listen to what he says. Each of us will give a personal account to God. Each of us will give a personal account 
to God. You know what he's saying? Every one of us who's ever been born, they tell us almost 8 billion people on planet Earth today, each one of us who's ever been born will give an account to God. Every one of us in this room will give an account to God for our life. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 9 through 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, <clears throat> verses 9 through 15. Notice what it says. For we are both God's workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. Verse 10. Because of God's grace to me, I have, Paul says, I've laid the foundation as an expert builder. Now, others are building on it. But whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful. Why, Paul? For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 12. Anyone, everybody say anyone. anyone. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw, but on the judgment day. Now who's he talking to? He's talking to Christians. He's talking to believers. He says on the judgment day. So we're going to face a judgment day. Every one of us in this room are going to face a judgment day. But on the judgment day, the fire will show if a person's work has value. If the work survives, the builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. Now, the builder will be saved, but like bar someone barely escaping through a wall of flame. Now listen to what he's saying. He's saying every person, every person is going to give an account unto God for their life. And then he goes on to, in, in, the, in the book of Corinthians, he says, now, there's coming a day, and the Bible talks about this, that God is going to separate the sheep from the goats. The sheep being those who've accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. How many of you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Raise your hand. Well, you're a sheep. And the Bible says the sheep will be separated from the goats. The goats are those who have never accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now, when it comes to the judgment of the sheep, those who've accepted Christ, the Bible says our eternal destiny is not in question. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. When you and I accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, at that moment, whether you were 6, 12, 28, 42, 69, 74, whatever time you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, at that moment, you received eternal life. Your eternal destiny was decided. So when you and I stand before God as sheep, our eternal destiny is not in question. It's not whether you're going to make heaven or not. That's already been decided. You've already accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you already have eternal life. Now the goats, those who've not accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, when they stand before God, their eternal destiny is in grave danger. They have not accepted Jesus, so their judgment is totally different than the Christian's judgment. Well, then what are the Christians, are gonna, what are the Christians gonna be judged for? What are believers gonna be judged for? You say, we're all gonna give an account. So if our eternal destiny is not in judgment, then what's our judgment gonna be about? Look what he says in the book of Corinthians again. He says, God's gonna judge us for our work. God's, God's gonna judge every one of us if we fulfilled our purpose that he's called us to do, his plan for our life. And if we have, if our work, if our life's work has value, then our works will remain and we'll get a reward for that. If our life's work does not have value, if we've not fulfilled God's plan, if we've not been obedient to God's plan for our life, then we'll be saved, we're going to heaven, but our, all of our work will be burned up. It'll be burned up. So understand it's vitally important for you and I to know what God's plan is for our life because we're going to give an account for that. And not only that, our eternal, our eternal welfare is going to be determined by how well we accomplished what God called us to accomplish down here on earth. 
It's not a matter of heaven and hell. It's a matter of the stuff we get in heaven. And I've already put in, I'm getting me a white Range Rover. That's what I'm going to do. And plenty of food. And I've already told the Lord, I know there's no marrying or giving in marriage. And I promise you, there won't be no hanky-panky. But in my mansion, I'll live up the top. Man can live down the bottom. Save your time. You don't need to build us two mansions. I'll just live with her, if that's okay with you. Won't be no hanky-panky. I promise there won't be no hanky-panky. But I just want to see her every day. Make sure she's not dating nobody else. That's exactly what I want to do. It's important we get it right down here. It's important that you and I know why we're here. And God's not hiding that from us. He's not playing hide and seek. He wants you to know your purpose and what he's called you to do. What kind of parent would tell their child? How many parents do we have in the room? Raise your hand. Aren't aren't grandkids great? Aren't grandchildren great? Did you notice I didn't say kids? I said grandchildren. Aren't grandchildren great? What kind of parent, what kind of parent would tell their child this? Hey, there's a reward waiting on you. There's a reward waiting on you. And the child says, well, what kind of reward? And the parent says, well, you'll just have to figure that out. And then the child says, well, what direction do I go? Which way do I go to get this reward? Where is it at? And the parent says, Man, you just have to figure that out. And then the child says, well, how will I know if I'm going in the right direction? I'm moving right to get this reward. And the parent says, honestly, you just need to figure it out. And then the child says, how will I know if I've succeeded in fulfilling the responsibilities to get the reward? And the parent says, well, just to be honest with you, when you die, you'll find out. Uh, You just got to wait till you die till you find out if you've done it right or not. See, as parents, we would never be so vague and confusing concerning a decision that affected our child's eternal destiny and quality of life. Yet that is how many Christians believe God expects us to find out his plan for their life. What does God want me to do? I don't know, just follow this clue, and maybe if you find that clue, you can find this clue, and if you find that clue, maybe it'll lead you to this place, but you really won't know till you die and stand before God. That is not the way God works. Listen to it. Listen to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse number 7. Listen to what Jesus says. Keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. That's that's pretty confident, Jesus says. All you have to do is keep seeking, keep asking, keep knocking. You're going to get your answer. And then he says in verse 9, he's talking to parents. He says, you parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread... Do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So if you sinful people, carnal people, human people, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Everybody say, how much more? How much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? You know what he's saying? If you want to know God's plan for your life, you don't have to go on a lifelong scavenger hunt trying to figure this thing out and hoping you get it right. God will tell you what his plan is for our lives. He will reveal. In fact, he wants to reveal it to us so that we can get it right down here so that we can accomplish his purpose, be our best for which we were created, and also be a blessing to humanity. God wants us to get it right. Listen to what he says. Proverbs 4, 18 and 19 again. Let's go back to our very first verse. The way, the path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, which shines brighter until the full light of day. He says... He says, the way God wants us to live our life, the way God wants us to go, our path, our calling, our purpose, 
It's like the first break of the sunrise every morning with its beauty, with its splendor. Once you realize your purpose, your reason for being here, God's call and plan for your life, once you realize that, that's, it's like the breaking of the dawn. It is filled with majesty and glory and brightness. But he says, that's just the beginning because it just gets brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter up until the end of day. You know what he's saying? He's saying God's plan for our life. He then not only just wants us to know it when it begins, he wants to lead us in every season of our life. He has a plan for every season of our life. People say to me, well, you know, I knew God wanted me to be an engineer. I knew God wanted me to be a a housewife. I knew God wanted me to be an educator. I knew, but now that's over. What is there a God have a plan? The Bible says his plan gets brighter and brighter. It just doesn't stop when you finish your career path. It just doesn't stop when your children leave the house. It just doesn't stop when you reach retirement. It just doesn't stop when you finish university. It doesn't stop. Just because one plan for your life is finished doesn't mean all the plans for your life is finished. The Bible says it gets brighter and brighter till the end of our life. God has a plan for every one of our lives. And the Holy Spirit says the direction, the plan for the child of God gets brighter and brighter. Now, for people who don't know Christ... People who don't know Christ, notice what it says, Proverbs 4, 19. Notice what it says. But the way of the wicked is total darkness. They have no idea which direction to go. They'll do this. They'll chase the dollar one day. They'll chase this activity one day. They'll chase this recreational pursuit one day, trying to find happiness. They'll chase this relationship one day. They'll trace, chase this trip one day. They live for the next exciting adventure, and, they, and they're never fulfilled in life. Why? Because that's the way of the unrighteous. They're in darkness, but that's not the way for the child of God. You know, as I've grown older, my perspective on things have changed. Uh, when I was young, uh, when I was a, a, a young uh, child or even a young adult, um, uh, my focus was on starting everything, was on the future, was on beginning, starting university. I was the first uh, person in my family on either side, mom or dads, who ever went to university, first one to ever graduate from university, starting my ministry. I was focused on starting my ministry, owning our first home, starting our family, owning our first home. I remember telling Amanda, I said, Amanda, we're going into ministry as you don't make money in ministry, so chances are we'll never own a home. We'll probably have to live in a parsonage, a church-owned facility. That's when pastors used to do that. They didn't, they didn't pay them a lot of money, so they give them a place to live that was owned by the church. So we'll probably never own our own home. In fact, some of the first churches where we were youth pastors, they provided us housing in what they call the church parsonage. And we thought we will never own our own home. Everything was, so for us to own a home was huge. I mean, it was really huge. Starting our family, starting our family. Everything was about starting. Starting my savings and retirement. Starting my hobbies. And then the kids come along. And then it's starting T-ball. Oh, World Series means nothing. To all good t-ball. The first horse ride. If it wasn't for little girls, horses would be lonely animals. Can I tell you something, parents who have little girls, young little girls, do not get in the horse thing. Get into cows. You can eat a cow. You can't eat a horse. The first day of kindergarten. Wonderful. First day, everything was about starting. Everything was about beginning. Everything was about the future. And now as I'm getting older, just turned 66 years of age, and, and honestly, still an unbelievable stud muffin. Now, <laughs> now though honestly among friends, because we're friends, I must say I'm less stud and more muffin than I used to be. <laughs> but my head, my head continues to think as it always did. It wants to focus on starting. I still think I can do it. 
My head still tells me I can do everything that I've always done. In fact, I can do it better because I'm smarter than I used to be. I steal things I want to see and I want to try and do. I see on social media that a company is hiring. And I want to fill out an application. I've gone to so many businesses' websites to look at the qualifications. And I, you know what I've discovered? I'm overqualified for everything. <laughs> Just overqualified. But I don't mind taking less pay if I, if I got something to do. I drive by billboards and I read that a company is given a signing bonus. And I think I can do that. And I can do that. And I can pick, I'll at least work long enough to get the bonus. And then I can get me some money for the kids' grandbaby's college funds. I can do that. I see advertisements for universities and fields of study. Listen to me. I made a mistake. Don't ever put out an interest to a university that you're wanting to come there. They will bug the fire out of you. I drive down Highway 111 and that school that training school on Highway 111 has on their sign, become a medical technician in nine months. And I got to figuring that up. Nine months, I'm still 66 years of age. And the company that hires me will save money because they don't have to pay health insurance because I'm on Medicare. <laughs> they don't have to pay health insurance. It cannot be difficult to be a medical technician. I got that. I can figure that out. Scalpel, scalpel, drill, drill. Stitches, stitches, forcep, forcep, light, light. See, I've watched every episode of Emergency NYC on Netflix. <laughs> I got this thing figured out. And a year and five months ago, four months ago, I had quadruple bypass surgery, and I was back in the office in two weeks. This ain't a big deal. I can be a medical technician in nine months. You see, for many, their goal is to retire and slow down. And that's okay. Nothing wrong with that. If that's what you want to do, that's fine. But I still enjoy dreaming it and desiring. I still want to go get it. I still want to do it. Recently, I told Amanda, I said, baby, I feel so good. I feel better than I have in 25 years. I said, you are married to the stud of studs. I said, I feel great. I think, Amanda, I really believe I've got one more great church in me. I've got one more. Let's go rescue one more church. And then the spirit of Pentecostal preacher come on me. Amanda, Amanda, thousands, multitudes, are in the valley of decision. Their lives are dangling over the precipice of hell. And I got the fire of the Holy Ghost shut up in my bones. There's a heaven to gain and there's a heaven to shun, Amanda. I see the Lord leaning over the banister of heaven and he's saying, who will go with me and whom shall I send? Oh, Amanda, surely, surely we've got one more great church in us. Would you, would you join Join me, Amanda. Just come on. Join. We, let's go rescue some hurting people. We can do it. We can say, here am I, Lord. Uh, send me. Like, well, let's go. Can't, will you do it? Will you do it? And Amanda looked so sweetly at me and smiled, picked up the grandbaby and just walked off. <laughs> I said, Amanda, I guess that means No. You see, though my head says I can start again, my head says I can start again, my heart reminds me the finish is closer than the start. I've got more days behind me than I do before me. And I want, to look, I want you to look at a verse of Scripture. And for many of you here today, as you review your life, you're where I am. You've got more days behind you than you do before you. So does God still have a plan in my next 30 years, 20 years, 15 years, 10 years, for some five years? Is God's plan for me over and I'm just drifting from here on out? Listen to what Paul says. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Paul says this, As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've remained faithful. 
And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize, the reward, is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to hear his appearing. You know, uh, we hear this verse all the time. If you've been to a funeral lately, you've been to a memorial service, you've heard this verse read. And the context that most people think about it is my life is over. So if that person's life is over, then they finish their race. If your life is over, you finished your race. That's the context. And that's okay, but it's really not an accurate interpretation of this scripture. Because look at what verse 6 says again. You've got to go to verse 6 to get the real context of the whole passage. He says, as for me... My life has been already been poured out as an offering to God. See, just because a person dies doesn't mean they finish their race. Listen, when a teenager gets hit by a drunk driver and they die, they haven't finished their race. When a young mom has an incurable disease and has babies at home and dies, they haven't finished their race. Their bodies died, but they haven't finished their race. See, there's a lot of people that die that do not finish their race. Listen to what Paul says. Before he ever talked about dying, he says, the the time of my departure at hand. But before he ever talks about his departure from this earth, his life ending, he says, my life has been poured out as an offering to God. You know what he's saying? I fulfilled my purpose for being here. I've done everything God wanted me to accomplish. I've been obedient to what he's told me to do. My life has fulfilled its mission. He says, and oh, by the way, by the way, I'm getting ready to die. But the first thing he says, I've fulfilled my purpose for being here. Now I'm getting ready to die, but my purpose has been fulfilled. Notice what he says. Verse 7, 2 Timothy 4, 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have remained faithful. Notice before he said, I ever fought the good fight, he said, I finished. Uh, before I fought the good, before I finished my race, notice before, before he said, I finished my race, he says, I fought the good fight. What's the good fight? Well, look what it says in 1 Timothy 6 12. Look at 1 Timothy 6 12. What's the good fight? Fight the good fight of true faith. How many of you realize? To start in faith and to end in faith between, there's a lot of battles. There's a lot of wars. See, the life of faith is filled with opportunities for distractions, hurts, betrayals, disappointments, temptations, mess-ups. And it's easy if we're not careful to begin serving Jesus, but then at the end, get intercepted or detoured or interrupted. And we all know individuals who at one time had a vibrant faith, who had a very intimate relationship with Christ, but something happened to them along the way. Some hurt One of the things I hear, the term I hear all the time now is church hurt. Well, I experience church hurt. Well, what do you expect? You're going to get hurt in church. You know why? Because church is imperfect people. And imperfect people do imperfect things. That's no excuse for falling out from Christ, leaving your faith, or even leaving Christ's body, the church, just because somebody did you wrong in the church. Jesus' own disciples did him wrong, but he didn't fall out of fellowship. He established the church after that, and he never lost fellowship with his heavenly Father. So in this life of faith, if we're going to finish, notice what Paul said before he finished his race. He said, I had to keep the faith. I fought the life of faith. So if you and I are going to finish our race, Not just die. We're going to die. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. You're going to die one day, whether you want to or not. As Pastor Bobby says, death runs in his family. 
Nobody's ever escaped it. Mine also. I'm going to die unless Jesus comes. I'm going to die one day whether I want to or not. But just because death comes doesn't mean that my life is over then or I fulfilled my purpose just because I've died. I can know I've fulfilled my purpose before I ever get to death by being obedient to what God has called me to do. I hear it all the time. I have, Pastor, I, I didn't serve Jesus my early days. My young adult days, I was busy building my career. I, I just wanted to be successful. I wanted to be a successful businesswoman. I wanted to be a successful businessman. I just didn't have time for God and the things of the church. Now that I've gotten older and wiser and settled down a little bit and realized the frailty of life, now I realize that I need Jesus, but I've wasted so much time. Maybe you've lived your life an addict. Maybe your fam addiction was a part of your family's life. And maybe it just jumped on you and you didn't know life other than that and you just followed their behavior. But now you've gotten older and you realize that's not the way I want to live. That's not really God's plan for my life. There's something better. I've been groping in darkness, but now I see that God's got a plan for my life. But I've wasted so much of my time. Does he still have a plan? I, we baptized a man not long ago who was in his 80s. Accepted Christ in his 80s. Got baptized in his 80s. His thoughts were, is there still, does God still have something for me or am I just going to get baptized and go to heaven? Have I wasted my entire life? Am I going to stand before God and say, well, you got, and he's going to say, you got in, but that's all. Is that all I have left? Have I just wasted my time? Look what the Bible says. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 20. I love this. Matthew chapter 20. I got two minutes, so hurry. Matthew chapter 20. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner, Jesus is talking, who went out early one morning to hire workers for his vineyards. He agreed to pay the normal daily wage and sent them out to work. At nine o'clock in the morning, he was passing through the marketplace and saw some people standing around doing nothing. Verse 4, so he hired them, telling them he would pay them what whatever was right at the end of the day. So they went to work in the vineyard, and at noon, and again at 3 o'clock, he did the same thing. He found some other guys at noon, found some people at 3 o'clock. At 5 o'clock, verse 16, that afternoon, he was in town again and saw some people standing around. He asked them, why haven't you been working today? They replied, because no one has hired us. The landowner told them, then go out and join the others in the vineyard. That evening, he told the foreman to call the workers in and pay them. Beginning with the last workers first, when those hired at five o'clock were paid, each received a full day's wage. When those hired first came to get their pay, they assumed they would receive more. But they too were paid a day's wage. When they received their pay, verse 11, when they received their pay, they protested to the owner. Those people worked only one hour, and yet you paid them just as much as you paid us who worked all day in the scorching heat. Verse 13, he answered one of them, friend, I haven't been unfair. Didn't you agree to work all day for the usual wage? Take your money and go. I wanted to pay this last worker the same as you. Is it against the law for me to do what I want with my money? Should you be jealous because I am kind to others? Do you hear what he's saying? If you're late getting in, you're still going to get a reward. If you're late getting in, you're still going to have, God's got a plan for your life. He still put them to work and they still got their reward. Don't sit there and think, I've wasted my life if I can just make it to heaven by the skin of my teeth, that's all I'm hoping for. Fooey on you. That's not God's plan or God's purpose for your life. If you've 50, 60, 70 years of age and have just now got serious about fulfilling God's plan for your life, it's okay. God's got a plan for your life. So understand this. God has a plan. And he wants you to know that plan. And next week, what we'll talk about is how can I find it and how can I fulfill it? 
But let me leave you with a few scriptures. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. I know the plans, plural, not plan. See, I, I, talk to, I deal with a lot of people who've gone through the heartbreak of divorce. And they'll say, you know, this was our, God's plan for my life, but I went through this divorce. And, and now I'm remarried or I'm single and never want to be remarried, whatever. Is God's plan for my life messed up? Notice it doesn't say, I know the plan I have for you. It says, I, ha- I know the plans, plural, that I have for you. Psalm 37, 23, the Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Psalm 139, 16, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. God's got a plan for your life. Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's masterpiece. (laughs) I tell people all the time, I tell guys, every morning when you wake up, I do that. Amanda, look at me. Look, as we're laying in bed, look at me. I'm God's masterpiece. You ought to be thankful today. You slept with a masterpiece. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. Notice this. So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. See, God's got a plan for your life. Psalm 32, 8. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. He's not out here playing hide and seek with us saying, well, I got a plan, but I'm not going to tell you. You got to, you're on your own. Notice he says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life, I will advise you and watch over you. Psalm 48, 14. For, what is, for that is what God is like. He is our God forever and ever, and he will guide us until we, what? Die. Psalm 25, 12. Who are those who fear the Lord? He will show them the path that they should choose. Jeremiah 1, 5. I knew you, God said, before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, one of my favorite ones. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend upon your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Romans 8, 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. God has a plan and purpose for your life. And he wants you to find it and fulfill it. As our wonderful pastor says, who who can rhyme better than anybody. He's the best rhymer in all the world. He's a poet. He's the poet of Putnam County. And uh, as he says, God wants you in alignment with your assignment. Now, I can't rhyme like him. I set it up at night trying to think of rhymes, and I can't think of them. But I did come with this one. Find your spot, and if you're ever tempted to leave it, not. All right? (laughs) Stand with me, would you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're here this morning. You say, Pastor Eddie, I, I haven't really included God in my life, but something's been pulling at me. And I don't want to finish my life without Jesus. I do not want to finish my life without Jesus. I've never accepted him as my Lord and Savior. I'd like to ask him to come in my heart. We're getting ready to pray us one prayer. All of us are going to pray it together. So we're not going to single you out. We're not going to embarrass you in front of this large crowd. But if you'd like to ask Christ to come in your life when you pray, I'd just like to know it. So if you want to ask Christ to come in your life you never have before, or maybe you've gotten like one of those who got hurt, distracted, disrupted, interrupted in your life of faith, and you haven't been serving him, and you know you're not walking in his plan because every step you take is just chaos after chaos after chaos, darkness followed by more darkness. And you want to restore your fellowship with Christ. If either one of of those, you've never accepted Christ or you've been away from Christ and want to come back, 
Would you slip up your hand real quickly? Slip it up real quick. We're going to pray. Thank you. God bless you. Good for you. Good for you. Anyone else? Slip your hand. Thank you. God bless you. Good for you. Anyone else? Come on. Just raise your hand. We're going to include you in this prayer. All right. Let's everybody pray this. Heavenly Father, we believe Jesus died for our sins. We accept him now as our Lord and Savior. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Forgive me of my sin. Amen. Welcome to the family of God.